Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first art and market conference, Pivot, the Southeast Asian art world beyond COVID-19. My name is Nadia, and I'm the editor of Art and Market. Over the next five afternoons, we will be speaking with stakeholders from the Southeast Asian art world about how they're innovating to deal with the curveballs emerging from the COVID-19 pandemic, from immediate safeguards to long-term plans. The question for today is, how will public art institutions engage with audiences? The unprecedented shutdown of museums and other public art institutions worldwide has proven a major challenge to their reason for being. In this panel, we will speak about the challenges they face, inventive measures and strategies they have put in place to continue engaging with their audiences and the futures of their respective institutions. Before we begin, I would like to thank everyone for spending the next hour with us. If you have a question for a panelist, you can type it out anytime in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we will get to them at the end of the question and answer segment. I'm now pleased to introduce the panel. We have Aaron Sito, Director of Museum Marchan in Jakarta. Hi, Aaron. Hi. And uh, Shabir Hussein Mustafa, Senior Curator at National Gallery Singapore. Hi, Hi, Mustafa. And Zoe Butt, Artistic Director of the Factory Contemporary Art Center in Ho Chi Minh City. Welcome, Zoe. Hi. So I've asked everyone to bring a beverage to the panel discussion, and I hope the audience, you have one in hand too. And to start, I'd like to just propose a toast to everyone for making it through the uncertainties and restrictions of the COVID-19 pandemic this far. And here's to a great panel discussion. Cheers. <laughs> Okay, so let's start at the beginning. Uh, what were your institution's immediate reactions and solutions to closures? Maybe Aaron, you'd like to start? Well, I mean, one of the immediate things that we did is we, I set up a, a small group with inside the museum to review and to begin planning uh, our next steps. Um, when, probably it, by the end of January, beginning of February, we had begun to plan out um, I wouldn't say response at that point because we didn't know what we were actually responding to, but we were definitely uh, beginning to talk internally about uh, some best case scenarios and also some worst case scenarios. Mm. Okay, what about you, Mustafa? What, were, what was NGS doing at this time sort of to see what was going on and what was going to happen? Yeah, I mean, I think it's 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 quite similar to to Aaron's uh, sort of situation in a sense where um, situation was evolving so rapidly. Right? So in a sense, I think the museum had to immediately establish a kind of a crisis management team, I suppose, uh, which could effectively respond uh, to the shifting landscape. And of course, you know, I mean, being a, a rather large uh, collecting institution, right, and uh, sort of a real estate uh, that. The National Gallery occupies, this was a complex process. But I think uh, in consultation with the authorities, uh, we managed to put in some uh, safe distancing measures uh, very quickly and, and, and very fast, you know, from regular kind of temperature taking to, 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 to uh, travel uh, kind of histories and so on and so forth. And uh, also, you know, within the galleries, right? So we had to limit the number of people, but the guidelines were also constantly evolving, right? So. The, the, the front of house staff had to be constantly uh, kept informed and sort of retrained, I suppose, uh, every few days uh, with the newer guidelines. So yeah, I mean, I think, I think it was not easy, but, but, but kudos to, 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 to my colleagues uh, for, for really getting that uh, uh, together. Yeah. Right, so it's sort of like preparing for the worst, hoping for the best kind of a situation. Uh, what about for you, Zoe, at the factory? Well, we are not as big a beast as the National Gallery of Singapore, nor Machan. We're a very tiny team. And in Vietnam, we were, I think, one of the first in the region to have our door closures fairly immediate. And so that was an, uh, an indicative sign that our front of house staff and our public programming to do with children needed to be press pause. That was pretty fast. Our workshops for kids had to start pretty immediately. Also, I was aware that uh, many of our uh, audiences who were um, already wearing masks 
already somewhat in, you know, in Vietnam, it's fairly common. Everyone wears a mask anyway. So it was not uh, as uh, freakish as you'd like to think uh, from, from a Vietnamese perspective. So it was a little difficult to get audiences in the first instance before the official news came in that we had to have our sanitizing, we had to do contact tracing. So we were actually um, directly waiting for the ministry. We were working very closely with the ministry prior to the announcement. So we were aware what was going on in the lead up to the official words. Yeah, and I mean, pretty soon after, it was just like everything was closed, right? So um, audiences were unable to visit or are still unable to visit um, NGS and March on a Course and the Vectory is open. Uh, what online platforms have been helpful for continuing to engage with your audiences? You know, when workshops can't take place in person, for example, and exhibitions can be visited in person as well. Aaron? Okay. Um, well, lots of our programs already existed on uh, online anyway. We, ha we, have a, we have a pretty strong uh, social media presence, and I think that's partly the, the nature of, of Indonesia, and it's the nature of our, our audiences, which are, um, are uh, have a really strong millennial uh, group. Um, but we, we, we had to think very quickly about how to engage our audiences. We had to think very quickly about who our audiences uh, were because uh, as, as um, Mustafa was saying, it, it was a quickly evolving uh, situation and um, we have limited resources in terms of being able to, to turn around new programming. So we, ma we made some quick decisions about uh, what we wanted to do. And one of those things was that uh, we knew because we were all dealing with it at the same time that um, we wanted to we wanted to engage with uh, with our local audiences, and we wanted to be able to to continue the mission of the of the museum, which revolves around art education and art appreciation. So we were focusing uh, predominantly within the education space. So we we um, actually what we did first is we actually stopped and we we took stock of what we already had before we started to uh, even think about creating creating new programs. So our first um, strategy, if you want to put it that way, was to was to make available the things that we had already done. So for since 2017, we've been presenting programs, we've been documenting programs, and we've also been disseminating our, our, our programs. So it was really, really um, uh, putting into into place some of those strategies that were already all, already in motion. Got you. And did you build on the capabilities of your individual websites as well then is my next question. Because you're saying that you built on what you've already, you'd already built or what you already started. Um, did you have to kind of, you know, make the website, you know, um, stronger in any way or, you know, introduce? So I, th I think because our, our website is, is, is um, uh, was something to be seen in conjunction with our, our real life um, physical our, 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 our physical um, uh, programming. So we had to really think about, well, well, if this was going to be our primary mode of, of communicate, communicating with people, well, we had, to, we had to do a few tweaks to the website. We also had to uh, review how we engaged on, on social media. Um, and it was really, really done very quickly. Um, my design team and my education team worked very hard and very quickly to uh, pull together pull together a program. Yeah, what about for NGS then, Mustafa? Um, because I see that you guys have, you know, the Gallery Anywhere initiative online, for instance, through social media, and I guess the children's Biennale sort of morphed maybe into small big dreamers at home. Could you tell us more about um, the online activations from NGS? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, I think the, the, the question of uh, museums working digitally uh, was already happening, right? I mean, to some extent, right? Museums had uh, identified um, that the digital is an interesting sphere uh, to occupy. I suppose we haven't really figured out <laughs> what are the limits uh, or the kinds of opportunities uh, that this sphere represents. Right. I mean, in a way, I think it's a bit slow to evolve on the digital sphere, but, but these, these conversations were already happening at the gallery. And so in a sense, I think, um, what happened was that as soon as sort of the, 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 the safe distancing measures and all these sorts of limitations began to uh, kind of kick in, so to speak, 
um, the, 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 the gallery started to think about how uh, we can begin to build, I suppose, context, right, uh, digitally, because I think resonating with what Aaron said earlier, uh, so much of uh, websites, right, museological websites, are sort of built on uh, being sort of extensions of physical exhibitions or educational spaces or whatever it is, the program. So how does one actually generate uh, newer context, right, within uh, the, the, the digital sphere? So this is an interesting, I suppose, question uh, that's still lingering, right, and is, is, is being debated uh, to a large extent. But yes, Gallery Anywhere came online uh, relatively fast. I mean, it's an initiative that really attempts to sort of break down the key offerings of the gallery into multiple sort of parts. So it could be from what the educators are doing, uh, what the programming team is doing, for instance, what the curators are doing, right? And, and what sort of exhibitions. So we had, for instance, the Lapis Mohit in Pago Pago exhibition, uh, which really just opened on the eve of Circuit Breaker uh, 1.0, right? If you want to call it. In fact, we met at the press preview. That's right. And, uh, Amazing show. Yeah. It's a yeah, and, and, yeah. And in a way, it sort of closed, right? Uh, uh, as soon as it opened. Right? Uh, and, and so we started thinking about how one can kind of shift uh, some of that content online. And, and yes, absolutely. I mean, also uh, the curatorial programming team, right, had been doing so much work in terms of symposia and all these things and we had all that content that was ready so a lot of it is now making its way uh, onto the gallery's website but also the youtube channels social media and so on and so forth. i think it, it's all sort of integrated i suppose uh, or it has to be uh, in, in in these times right so yeah it's 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 an evolving question but also uh, you know the gallery has a blog called perspective so we've been inviting artists also to reflect on on their on their experiences right uh, through uh, through the pandemic so most recently one of the initiatives is called out of isolation mm -hmm. where we have artists really writing um, uh, about uh, the, the present moment as they're experiencing it or working through it right or trying to make sense of it uh, best they can so so it's 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 multi-pronged yeah yeah and what about for you, Zoe? Do you guys use social media more, for instance, or you know how have you built on you know your online capabilities as well for the factory? We have a, a really active Facebook. Um, our Instagram channels are also pretty constant. So feed through that for every single uh, program we run is is standard. However, when the COVID nineteen did hit. One of the things I noticed, not only about my team, but about many other cultural workers in dialogue with us, there was a, a, a res reticence to immediately react. Mm. There was a sense of, you know, we need time to process what's going on. There was a lot of confusion. There was a, a, a sense of, do we need to particularly only program for the online? Are we allowed some time to digest? So with my team, we, we talked about this a lot, about what does it mean to digest and how is this constant barraging of COVID-19 symptoms, COVID-19 causes, COVID-19 futures. And we started to realize that one of the things that we're wanting to get our heads instead stuck on is ideas. So we started using our Facebook and Instagram channels to feed out research that was relatable, relatable to, to particular programs that were running, like Realigning the Cosmos, which is a fellowship program where we're looking at the investment of the elements, how consumption of these elements according to spiritual belief are causing overexploitation or perhaps neglect. So we started feeding our Facebook pages and our Instagram feeds with differing sets of stories that were somewhat related to COVID, but not necessarily having to indulge in, in just the calamity of the moment. Now, these programs, uh, several that we've got ongoing, actually were relating to the response uh, of COVID-19. So we found the period of being able to produce online uh, was, an, was a good research period for us as curators at the factory also. Great. And do you think all these measures, you know, that you've um, come up with for online engagement with the audiences, will they stay? Because I feel like everyone is so keen to just, you know, get into physical spaces and just stop with all these online events. Um, we're just so much like dying to have social interaction. So do you think that these will continue to be a mainstay for your institutions or do you feel that there are more stopgap measures for the pandemic? 
I think there's a, a, a bit of, um, uh, I think there are two things that are going on for us. I think there's a silver lining. And one of the, that silver lining for us is that lots of our programs have been accessible by people who wouldn't normally have the capacity or, or don't live in the same city as us. Um, so I know, for instance, we're working on a, on a teacher's forum, an educator's forum in the, in the next couple of weeks. And it's been an opportunity for us to go in and reach out to teachers who don't live in Jakarta. So um, uh, I think we, it's been a learning curve as well in terms of how to deliver programs uh, as webinars or as um, on, on online dig, digital uh, programs. But I think at the same time, people still crave that physical interaction. And, and, and you know, I mean, that's what we probably what um, we all miss to some, to some extent. Um, but at the same time, I think that, that there will, these programs will stay because, because um, you know, for us at least, the, the, the opportunity to have a much broader um, diverse audience engaging with programs and getting involved in our educational activities is 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 something which is quite exciting. Mm. So you were saying, Zoe, that it's been a time for research for your team, and Erin is saying that it's kind of created an opportunity to engage with people you wouldn't have otherwise engaged with, maybe not so soon um, after much has opened. And, you know, do you think that um, it has been a time of in introspection for the institutions? And is there going to be a change in priorities, you know, when all the lockdowns have been lifted and we go back to the normal? What do you think? Yeah, I, I definitely think that the level of introspection for us here has been real. I mean, we've had our salaries cut, we've had our program budgets cut, our operation hours reduced, our public service uh, hours reduced. And all within that is um, ultimately a sense of, well, where's our commitment line if we're now going to be split between potentially two different jobs for each individual in order to survive. So as the director of the institution, I've been quite concerned about how do we maintain our own interests as the workers inside the institution so that our level of passion for the public can remain. So we've discussed as a team the need to meet regularly about you know, particular strands of research that's running inside the institution just for us mm -hmm. uh, to create more opportunities for uh, discussion and dialogue within the team uh, so that we feel that we have the time to nurture because the hours have crunched and the danger there is that you feel like you're in a factory line of producing for the point of a deadline only and I'm really nervous about that when it comes to creativity. So at least on the part of my own staff, I, I really want to try and find uh, avenues that we can still feel we have time to think uh, because on the one hand you can say we've got more time but on the other hand economic demands on an individual basis step in and you might not invest that so I'm trying to find the equal ground so that we can still maintain that level of commitment to ideas yeah what about for you Aaron um, at Museum Marchand um, so Zoe has talked about for example like the budgets being cut you know have you been um, yeah, affected by this as well of course, I think everyone has been been affected by this. Yeah. Um, you know, our programs have been cut. We're we're, we're relooking at what our programs look like um, into the future. We've restructured as well. Um, but going back to the interest, introspection uh, question, I think that there there are a, a number of of ways of of viewing this. I think. Um, in terms of how we engage with each other, it's required us to be much more empathetic. So how we how we uh, uh, talk to or or how we um, uh, get pr um, project ideas up and running. Where maybe we're we're a little bit more in tune with each other because we're also aware that there that we're we're potentially struggling with this uh, screen interface as, as as well. So so I think that the that the in some ways it allows people to understand the kind of human motivations of, of our, our colleagues who, who, who wish to work in the arts um, and who wish to contribute to, to, uh, to, to, to the museum. But I think also that there, is, that there, is, there will be more introspection in terms of the program as well, because I, I, I don't believe that, that the scale of programming, uh, you know, the big international projects are, 
uh, feasible right now. It'll be a, it'll be a little while before um, it'll a little while before we, we're able to to program some of those those um, big projects. But it does again. It, it opens up an opportunity for for the uh, the teams to to think about uh, projects that they may have been been really dying to see and uh, dying to get to to to, um, uh, to, to develop and and to bring new viewpoints from the from the team members in in uh, creating and and shaping the program for the future right so taking ownership of what's to come um what about for you at ngs mustafa i mean you were talking about how the latif mohidin show kind of effectively closed as soon as it opened um and i know that there have also been other exhibitions cancelled especially the the so-called blockbuster ones uh, which require yeah. the lending of a borrowing of works and things like that can you talk more about that Sure. I mean, I, I think maybe also to speak to the question of introspection here, right? So, I mean, introspection uh, can happen, uh, I think, at two levels. I mean, there's, of course, the kinds of internal dialogues, right, uh, that we have with colleagues. And this could range from questions of really just surviving economically uh, to making it through uh, this, this, this very complex period, which we are still very much in and within, uh, psychologically, right? Um, but I think it's also about developing um, really crucial dialogues with stakeholders, right? Uh, beyond uh, the museum as well, and uh, and and bringing in uh, artists uh, as well or educators, right? Uh, who really have a stake within what the National Gallery does. So 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 in a sense, I think so much of uh, the curatorial work, I suppose uh, that. That, that we've been doing and what I have been doing in the past two to three months has, has relied on listening and listening uh, in ways where we are not purely driven by the deadlines, right, of constantly producing uh, these exhibitions as they come and evolve, but also maybe using this time to, to think, right, how is it that we are going about doing it, right? So, I mean, and, and, and I mean, uh, these, these questions have been around pre-COVID, right? So, I mean, uh, there have been bigger debates about the carbon footprint of, of museums and the art world and so on and so forth, right? So, in a sense, I think uh, a lot of these questions are coming now to the forefront uh, a little bit more, I suppose, uh, and with a little bit more urgency, I guess, uh, as, as, as the planes uh, stop flying, right, so to speak. Yeah, so you're right, uh, Nadia, just to uh, uh, respond as well with regards to the, uh, th there were two uh, exhibitions, uh, one was canceled and another postponed. Uh, so we had a Matisse uh, Picasso exhibition that was supposed to be held, which was canceled, it's sort of uh, co-organized with uh, the National Gallery of Australia. And another exhibition, which is a little closer to my heart, uh, which looked at, uh, was ever present, right? So the art of uh, uh, the first peoples of uh, Australia, right? Which, uh, which unfortunately had to be postponed because so much of the logistics, right? Involved in, 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 in producing such large exhibitions was just not feasible, mm -hmm. um, at least in the last two to three months, right? Even though the exhibition was scheduled to open in, in August, but we knew, right, uh, with, 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 with some, Algorithms, I guess, um, that uh, that that it's 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 just not going to be feasible. So I think I think there are there are there there is this this idea of introspection is is multifold, right, and and also evolving because we're still in it at, at this moment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, do you think with you know the budgets um, being cut and of course you know the idea of scaling back is is just the natural response from everyone. Um, has there been any kind of assistance from the government, uh, from your patrons, you know, in terms of donations? Has there been any sort of help given to you um, in that aspect? Maybe <laughs> Zoe's just like, I don't even have words. <laughs> no, none. Um, <laughs> what about for, maybe for us in Singapore, maybe Mustafa, you could talk a, a little bit about that. How have we been supported by the government, I guess? I mean, I think I think the the support system uh, endures, right? In a sense, I think it's it's not just I mean, not just the, the state uh, per se, but it's also the different arms, right, of the state, uh, which has looked into livelihoods uh, largely, right? So we know that the National Arts Council, for instance, rolled out a whole series of of measures, uh, including uh, the ministry, right, uh, which aided. 
the museums, I think the museum sector at large. Uh, so one of the initiatives uh, that did receive funding was uh, for uh, kind of uh, digitization programs, right? So sort of initiatives that the museum could roll out uh, that would enhance access to the collection. Because I mean, don't forget, the National Gallery is a collecting institution as well, right? And, and, and the collection is really at the heart of so much uh, that, that we do. So getting all those stories out uh, to the schools, uh, to the kids, right, to the different stakeholders, right, that the public is, is multifold and complex, right, to say the least. Uh, so these, these initiatives were, 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 were welcomed and I think encouraged. So in a sense, I think uh, it's, it's been largely, largely positive, I would say, yeah. Okay, what about for you at Museum March on Aaron? And then we'll get back to Zoe. Well, one of the things that we did, I mean, I really want to talk about us. So I think one of the things that we noticed as soon as the, the pandemic was hit was hitting is that there was a real concern for uh, artists and also for art workers. Um, you know, there are uh, artists and they, they, the community that surrounds us, they exist on very precarious um, incomes, you know, uh, really hand to mouth sometimes. Uh, exhibitions were being cancelled, uh, opportunities were, were, were disappearing. So one of the things that we did is that we realised that we actually had some infrastructure within the museum mm -hmm. to uh, not so much fundraise, but to create an art drive for the community. And so we, we've um, developed this project called Arasan Karya, which is a, a three month program where it's effectively a raffle. You know, we have a hundred artists, uh, we sell a hundred tickets, we bring artists, we bring the art community, we bring the collectors, we bring the general public all together to help create some positivity at this really strange, um, this really strange time. We raise very small amounts of money, but it's really about um, making people aware in the broader public that there is a much deeper impact on the artist community and that everyone, it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter if, you, if you're interested in art, have, has, has relied on the, um, the generosity of artists over the last three months to, uh, for their nourishment in some way uh, to get through these, through these really weird times. So, the, that, so we, use the, we use the museum... Uh, infrastructure in order to encourage other people and from that we had sponsors come on board not to sponsor the museum but to sponsor the project and create care packages of food and staples for artists. I think that we have to be conscious that there are huge uh, differences in the socio-economic capacity of of the cities in which we, we, we live in. So, um, you know, what is disadvantaged in Singapore is completely different to the, to the Indonesian context. And, and I think that what we tried to do, especially with the taking of this name of, of an Arasan, which, a, which is a very traditional uh, Indonesian uh, concept, is to have a, much more of a local response to uh, the local situation. Fabulous. And what about for you, Zoe? I mean, how are you kind of, I don't know, saving costs where you can or um, raising funds? What, what are the plans? Well, in Vietnam, we don't have uh, the support of government. It's not something we look for also. <laughs> um, and when it comes to private support, uh, we are very lucky to have my benefactor and founder, who's the single benefactor and founder of the factory, it's quite a battle here in Vietnam to gain recognition for contemporary artists. And that's been our landscape forever. So under the landscape of COVID, it was um, as if we had just all disappeared for two months, but now we're back. So I think the difference with uh, Vietnam in comparison to Singapore or Indonesia is that life here has really quite uh, dramatically dangerously, may I say, returned. So, you know, we have openings on Friday night and there's a level to which the, the scale of the pandemic has been very minimized here. So understanding the long-term repercussions uh, for artists here, I don't think has quite hit. Most of the artists do rely on foreign support and that has been dramatically uh, affected. Residencies have been cut or drastically reframed and I think much of, the, of those residencies have been disasters if they've happened during the COVID-19 breakout of the seas. So when it comes to internal support we've uh, instead created programming dedicated 
dedicated to trying to reveal what artists have been doing during this so-called uh, social distancing. It's called Home, and it was basically asking to give recognition to artists returning to the basics, uh, responding to what it means to be social distancing. And it's an ongoing project where we're in a constant redefinition of what it means to be socially distancing, because I think that's also something, as we move out of the lockdown, that definition is changing, dependent on how much freedom you're allowed to move. So I'm preparing for the fact we'll get a second wave. And again, there'll be the need to have artists respond uh, through that differently. But as for help people coming and helping us, sadly, uh, I wish there was more. <laughs> Got you. And I mean, you're installing the upcoming show right now. Um, how is that like, you know? Well, it's been raining like cats and dogs so it's like been another layer we've had the the COVID-19 issues of trying to get the shipments in from the US which has been um, a little bit of a battle because we've been relying on when shipments are allowed out of the US into Vietnam uh, but you know we did get it in so this is good um, and then just dealing with the yeah the weather right now it's it's pretty uh, full-on over here in, in Vietnam but everything is hands on deck. Um, we've got literally, no one's even really wearing masks anymore. It's, it's you know, we've had uh, nearly 60 days of no community transmission. So here it feels very much like it party time and let's get back to work. That sounds amazing to me because here we have <laughs> hundreds of cases every day. <laughs> but, you know, what are you looking forward to you know, with the opening of this exhibition? Um, do you think it will be, you know, the same numbers that you usually get with openings? Um, what was going to happen, do you think? I'm actually scared we'll have too many people. <laughs> okay. Going by what uh, other local galleries who have had openings in the last week, it seems like everyone is so tired of being at home. Yeah. It's just like, let's go out, let's have a good time. Um, but the weather may impact us because the rain is pretty intense. But the attitude, the spirit is very much, we're here to just get on with things. Um, there's many artists that I've seen in the last few days who are concerned about their international participation, what that means for their future, considering that an artist's value is still relying on participation in biennales and exhibitions. So what happens to their value if those exhibitions and biennales are not happening? I think they have valid questions that, um, at least as, as the sort of uh, interlocutor in the community, I, I'm very much aware that that is a, a fact that needs to be addressed on the international circuit. Yeah, but it's also so difficult to address because, I mean, it's also dependent on like travel restrictions and right. yeah. air ticket prices and things like that. Yeah, so I think it's just uncertain. Yeah, but I think... I think as institutions, I think we need to take stock. The next four years may look at a drastic reduction of participation, which doesn't necessarily mean we should be judging their practices as silent or quiet. Mm, got it. Um, what about for you, um, Mustafa and Aaron? Are you looking forward to, you know, NGS and Museum Marchand opening? And, you know, what are your concerns or what you're excited about as well? I mean, uh, I just wanted to kind of maybe uh, also respond a little bit to what Zoe just mentioned, right? So um, the, the kind of criteria, right, uh, through which we sort of measure artists uh, will also have to change uh, quite drastically. And, and in a sense, I think developing an entire set of newer vocabularies, right, uh, is, 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 is really going to be uh, sort of a key uh, curatorial uh, sort of uh, uh, trust, right, or line of inquiry uh, in, in, in the coming months, if not years, and something that needs to be done with, with urgency, I think. And, and I, I feel like um, we're only getting started. I know a lot of us have been spending time at home as well, those of us who are privileged uh, to stay at home uh, and have an income, I guess, also at the same time. But at, I, I I think, I think uh, there's, there's going to be a sort of a realignment uh, mm -hmm. in, in, in more ways uh, than, than one, right? And, and I just hope that all of it at the end of the day does uh, benefit artists, mm -hmm. right? And, and I think institutions too will have to kind of re-steer uh, themselves, whether the bigger ones or the smaller ones, I guess. So to what extent that remains to be seen. Um, 
as as the as the situation evolves, right? On almost on a daily basis sometimes. Yeah. But yeah, uh, Nadia, just to respond to to your question as well. Uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, you know, um, I think that's one of the things that you just can't do digitally is <laughs> is is experience art, right? So I I think there's been um, this sort of uh, a little bit of soul searching uh, with regards to the digital that it, should, it it's not a substitute uh, it's it's a completely different zone of engagement right and 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 we're still sort of developing uh, these vocabularies or adjectives whatever it is you want to call it uh, in terms of sufficiently describing uh, and enabling that but i think at the same time uh, the core function of showing art uh, will yeah absolutely i mean I'm, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to it, assuming, you know, we, we, we maintain all the necessary uh, precautions, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. In that sense, art is essential, uh, very much. Yeah. Well, a bit of background to Mustafa's comment. Um, in, the, yeah. in the daily newspaper in Singapore, um, they rank the jobs. Apparently, there was a survey of a thousand people, and there were essential jobs and non-essential jobs, and artists was ranked the highest. Um, as a non-essential job. 71% of people thought that that was non-essential. And of course, that has like spewed a whole bunch of like hashtags, like proudly non-essential, um, you know, things like that. It's, it's just really silly. And I, I really question um, the journalistic integrity of the newspaper for even publishing um, such, a, such a piece, you know, that doesn't really contribute anything useful. Um, but going back to you, Aaron, could you tell us more about, you know, what you're looking forward to, you know, um, welcoming people back to Museum Machan space and, you know, what are you concerned about at the same time? Um, I think like everyone, we're planning to reopen. We're, we're modeling lots of scenarios right now. Uh, similar to Zoe, one of those scenarios is being overrun with people. Um, uh, but I think what's, what's really interesting because we've done, we've, we've done a lot of research and we've been looking at things that are going, uh, going on around the world, not just in our own backyard and across Southeast Asia, across Asia and also in the West. Um, what I think that we're, we've come to the conclusion is that our, our response has to be um, in line with the community expectation. There's no point in taking um, attitudes or, or practices that are coming from Berlin and applying them to the situation in, in Jakarta. They, some of it might work, but a lot of it won't work. So, so my team right now has, has, has been synthesizing all of this information into a number of scenarios that we hope will uh, make sense for us. But going back to your, you know, to ask your, that other question again of yours, that, that I think that there will be a a much more, um, uh, you, you know, the, the digital will, will continue to have a presence within within the, the museum. Uh, as the staff is, is right, it won't replace the enjoyment of certain types of art, but it will be a, um, a place where people will be able to um, uh, enjoy and also learn different, you know, maybe it'll open up completely different perspectives on art. So when people actually get to have that physical experience, they'll be able to be, um, uh, you'll be able to enjoy it in, in, in many different ways. So I'm, I'm excited about yet yeah, uh, physically opening the doors, but I'm also excited about the opportunity this, this presents us to, to reset uh, lots of the assumptions about art that we, that we have, you know, around international participation, what this means, um, around, you know, maybe, maybe there are completely different ways of doing international participation, but we just, I, I would, maybe we're just too stuck in, in uh, older, older or different ways of, of, of thinking that we haven't yet worked out how to, how, how to do it. And I think that as much as that is a challenge for our, our organizations and for our, um, um, our curator friends, it's also something that's quite exciting. Yeah, you're right. I think this has sort of planted a seed of doubt about how things have been done and, you know, could things be done differently? But it's kind of taking us a, a bit of time because we've had to react immediately, right, to things that need to be solved right now. Um, for, to from my point of view, I mean, because the museum is, is so new. I mean, we opened in November 2017. Um, we, we've already been engaging in lots of these questions for the last couple of years. Um, we know that, that, that what, ha what works in Singapore doesn't always work in, in, in Indonesia. 
Um, so I think in some ways it's it's really it's it's really opened up within the within the staff uh, a very a very exciting conversation about how to imagine uh, the role of a museum in 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 society how how to how to um, uh, recalibrate it for for you know that very local situation. Thank you. Um, I mean, it's a difficult time for everyone. And as we've been speaking about, you know, things that are troubling within the art community and how we are all coping um, at home and with, you know, new ideas to bring people together. Uh, what has been heartening for you to witness at the same time as well, you know, in this time? So, for example, Erin, you're talking about how your team has come together and been really brainstorming, you know, and coming up with great ideas. Um, what else have you been seeing, you know, within your institution or just in the larger community that you think, you know, this is something great that's coming out from something very difficult and, you know, could be in place for a long time to come? Well, I think firstly, I, I, you know, it's really that human, um, those human interactions which have really heartened me. I think we're all stuck in a mess. You know, we've had to close, we've had to, we've had to cancel, we've had to cut. But I think the, the, um, the, the generosity and the inquisitiveness and the curiosity of, of staff and people in trying to brainstorm and to uh, work uh, uh, solutions is, has been the, the most interesting thing because what it has done, I mean, from my perspective, it's also cut through some of the high-low issues that you find within organizations, that ideas only come from certain, certain uh, groups within, within your staff. Because we're all forced within this, this weird communication system, actually the ideas are coming from many different places and they're being tested. I mean, we have to test some of our, uh, my middle-aged assumptions around uh, social media with younger staff members. I mean, that, that, that's been quite um, fascinating to watch. Okay. What about for you, Zoe? I mean, you were saying you have a pretty small team. Um, has that changed, you know, how things have been done or is sort of pretty much, you know, business as usual and how you communicate with your team members? Uh, during lockdown, we were on Zoom every second day and that was more about just touching base personally. Uh, we found ourselves for one month with no pay, no work. So during that time, uh, we did get to know each other, I think, better than we had before. It was an odd experience to be doing that through Zoom instead of on person because your factory deadline processes are not present. But then what was quite heartening through that was all of us, despite not getting paid, were determined to build programming whilst we were in this state, concerned for the sake of artists and concerned for the state of ourselves and our own brains with what matters most for us. I think as the artistic director, for me personally, one of the brilliant but unexpected things of COVID was being invited to take part in other think tanks of similar sister organisations across the world. And so because of COVID, I've now come to find myself in a network in South Asia, mm. uh, one between Latin America and the Middle East, and then another one, uh, which, which is actually truly quite global and it's a bit of a nightmare in terms of zone handling of times. But I've found that as um, mutual directors coming together to see how we're all dealing with the crisis globally in different stages of the lockdown, and to think about how we're going to engage the topics that have resulted as a consequence of COVID-19. That being, you know, the opaque governance, the sense that our climate has really uh, become quite healthy with the lack of human mobility. Um, you know, what, what is our human to non-human relationships? What are we doing about this? And considering the virus started about a conjunction of issue between these two beings. I mean, there's so many questions that have actually come up and I've really, as the director of the institution, being quite, um, I found solace by connecting to these other networks, networks that would never have actually popped up and eventuated had it not been for COVID-19. So that's an ironic, uh, positive outcome that will continue beyond lockdown, I think beyond the, the immediacy of what we're saying is COVID-19 right now. That's an interesting point you brought up because it seems like the pandemic will make it more insular, like you're looking within yourself, you're looking within your own institution, but actually it's opened up, you know, these relationships, these working relationships with institutions that, you know, would never have thought to work with or would have never had the opportunity to work with as well. What about for you, Aaron and Mustafa, has that happened? 
um, at NGS and, and Machan, respectively. Zoe, you wanted to say something or? Yeah, I just wanted okay. to add that one of the elements that is in unison across all of those think tanks for me is uh, all mutual desire to slow down, number mm -hmm. one. Uh, and to, to number two, try and assess structures of methods of working. And, and I think that I'm learning a lot and I share everything with my team. I share everything with the, the artists that we work with. And I have to say that right now, at least in my community, we're all feeling very similar about how can we slow down? Will we be allowed to slow down? Mm. Mm. I mean, I, 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 could, I could potentially also respond uh, to what Zoe just said, but also uh, the, the question at large, right? So, I mean, I think, I think whilst we've sort of socially distanced uh, ourselves, in fact, uh, we've also come uh, together in, in sort of extremely unexpected ways. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, the, the, the thing that this, this, this pandemic, I suppose, has proven is how interconnected, in fact, uh, we are right, and and how uh, the actions of of one individual or a group does impact the entire network, right? So how do we rethink our our role within this bigger kind of an ecosystem? And 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 this is going to permeate, I think, um, with. <laughs> Whether, whether we like it or not, I think, uh, in, in our everyday lives and, and, and also within artistic practice, because, I mean, for me, sometimes I, I don't really see a, sort of a, a distinction per se between art and, and life. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this has been quite fantastic because, I mean, I managed to, uh, a bit like Zoe, uh, sort of reconnect uh, with a whole series of individuals, artists mainly, Mm. Who, who, who for the longest time, right, would, uh, would, would, were able to sort of make the familiar less familiar, right? Uh, and, and I think this is the potential for art, right, that you can actually suspend reality and think about something else mm. uh, for, for that very moment, right? And in a sense, I think speaking to artists uh, has, and, and the manner in which I speak with artists has been, has changed, I, I realize, uh, and, 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 and accessing a lot of these networks digitally, I tell you, I wouldn't even have been able to access these networks if I physically went there. Because yeah. uh, you just don't have enough time, right? You always don't have <laughs> enough time, right? And so I mean, you're given this gift, yeah. uh, so to speak, right? Uh, and, 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 and you find yourself connecting at so many different levels uh, and talking about things which probably we were always thinking about, but doing it. Uh, on, on a very different set of terms, right, and, mm. and, 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 and methods. Yeah. So that's, that's been very, it's been very humbling, uh, yeah, learning from artists uh, in that sense. Yeah. Yeah, great. And I mean, just for the last question before going to the Q&A, uh, what is your hope for your institution moving out of the pandemic and maybe for the larger Southeast Asian art world as well? Maybe Aaron, you can take us away with that. <laughs> um, you know, I, I hope that we get out of this a much more resilient organization. Um, I hope that the that we we are able to take on board lots of these conversations as as Zoe and Mustafa were talking talking about, and uh, turning them into something. Um, that's 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 what I hope. That, I, hope I mean, I think there is a silver lining in, in, as terrible and as as um, um, or, you know, restrictive this as the situation is as being, but I do think that there is there is an opportunity to rethink what our organisations do and who they do it for. Yeah, Mustafa or Zoe. I guess from my perspective, because I know budgets for big spot, blockbuster spectacle visual experiences will not be as uh, uh, easy to find. I hope that we instead really commit to education. Um, I have had many conversations over the past little three months with artists about how we can better address the, the streaming of education as a mode of exhibition making, mm -hmm. as opposed to always just thinking about them being visual experiences. If there's anything I've learned about COVID-19 is that we are in a landscape of gross, uneven, educative access, and we need to broaden the pool of who we call teachers. Mm. Thank you. And Mustafa? 
um, you know, I, I, I'm quite certain we're going to come out of this, right, um, at, at some point. And, and I think maybe two things, right? Uh, the first is to really think and rethink about expanding publics, right? Um, and and, and this, this pandemic has shown us uh, that there is a real need, right, to expand publics uh, in more ways than one. So I think that's one. Uh, my second hope also is that I think it might be a, a sort of uh, possible to rethink the, 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 the old kind of cliches of local global dichotomies uh, here. And potentially there might be a new kind of global dream space uh, that 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 we can we can lay claim to and activate right I think as as Aaron also mentioned through real projects so working through projects right um, and 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 enabling uh, these different visions that that will it will emerge I mean it's it's inevitable I think um, yeah. well I like the word dream space mm -hmm. um, so I think now we'll go into the Q and A. Um, so I have a question here from Sim Enti about volunteers. Um, how have you guys been engaging with your volunteers um, in this time? Yes. Well, for, for us, um, <laughs> our, our, volunteer, our volunteers have shrunk, and and and, and this is a necessity. Um, the, the the there has been less work for volunteers to to do. Um, but you know, of course, you know, the, the, yeah, the, our, our volunteering has, has has really shrunk. Okay. And uh, what are they doing right now? Doing what can they do um, with the museum at this time? Well, very, very not much. I mean, we've got a few volunteers who are helping out with um, some research and and contributing in 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 that way. Um, but most of our volunteers were involved in on-site uh, programs. So, so as the museum has closed, uh, so have lots of those volunteer exp experiences. One of the other challenges, because I know that. Um, it's been an internal conversation that, that you know, maybe we, what do we do with our intern programs, for instance? Mm -hmm. And uh, what, I've, what I have um, told my team is that they have to be very careful right now because it's hard enough to manage their relationship within the, um, uh, the existing team via, via Zoom. Bringing on, we just have to be, you know, interns are great and interns learn a lot from, from, the, from organizations. But they have to be, you know, the music, the, the organization has to be able to give uh, real and proper opportunities. And if, and at this moment, I, I, I just don't know if that's possible. Got you. Um, I have another question um, about exhibitions. So we were talking earlier about all these exhibitions that have, you know, been cut short or kind of like closed before they even opened. Um, so this is from Tanya Amador. Um, she's asking specifically about Malati Suradamo's exhibition when the museum reopens. Are there any plans to continue the exhibition and the performance? And I guess this applies for everyone else on the panel as well. Uh, we hope so. It's one of the the, um, the scenarios that we've modelled. Is that uh, you know we, we had we've got a whole lineup of some of Malati's most uh, important performances yet to be performed. Um, so we hope so. Watch this space. Uh, we hope to be able to make some announcements shortly. Great. What about for you, um, Mustafa? With the, for example, the Latif Mohidin show, will it stay open? I mean, absolutely. I mean, we're hoping also that the museum will open uh, as, as, as soon as it's feasible, right? Uh, but the exhibition runs till end September. Okay. Uh, but in the meantime, what we're doing is uh, we've been working very closely with uh, colleagues in the curatorial programming team to develop an entire symposium, uh, which is going to sort of think about speculative assemblages, you know, for, for livability, right? Uh, in, in, in this current context. And it's developed uh, in consultation with, with Latif Mohidin, who, who you know is a fantastic thinker, right? Uh, um, and, and poet and painter. So, so yeah, working um, with artists and generating perspectives. So I really hope, I really hope uh, that there'll be some contribution to, to those conversations as well, yeah. yeah. And Zoe, you were saying earlier something about slowing down and I think we all concur with that. Um, I have a question from Eve Hoon, who says, yeah, it's all great, you know, to have this slowing down, but then even with digitalization, we are sort of seeing that there's a lot of digital content coming up as well. Um, how are institutions thinking of achieving this new slowing down? Um, yeah, especially with like digital, there's really no, no boundaries, I guess, you know, so 
what do you think you you guys are going to do to sort of achieve that? Well, at the factory, our program rotations have dropped from four to three per year. So that means that we're doing three rotations a year, two shows at each time. So uh, automatically, our exhibition program has already been uh, reduced. Mm -hmm. uh, similarly, our public programs have also uh, reduced. Um, however, what has picked up is our collaborations with educative institutions, uh, which is on the one hand something of great um, relief and it's a bit of a coup to have those relationships because we've been building on them for the last 10 years, to have them finally seemingly drop. We don't want that to uh, be cut. Mm. So the slowing down really for me right now, it's still gestating in my head, but being visible puts pressure on the slow. So I ask myself, what do we do that is not visible, that gives us a little less pressure? So a lot of the programming we're doing with educational institutions is not something that will be open to a mass public. Mm. And I think that the, the definitions of what slowness means, for me at least, is very attached to what we make visible. So it's about bringing in particular public, some like what Mustafa was saying, is bringing different parts of your stakeholders together so that you're building something that is able to be a foundation for a visual moment in the future, but not necessarily having to make every single gathering a visible moment. Yeah. So it's about trying to give ourselves time to just think and be and process. We'll see what happens. Yeah, we will. And I just have a fun question to end this whole um, panel discussion from Jefferson Jong, who's going to moderate a panel uh, tomorrow, actually. He's asking you guys, if you were to curate an exhibition to capture the current situation, what title would you give it? You have one second <laughs> to come up with a fantastic title for each of the exhibitions. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's too much pressure. Too much pressure. Well, I mean, we're seeing lots of people creating during this time. And of course, we're always kind of reacting to what's going on and, and artists have been as well. Um, do you think actually there will be more of such exhibitions coming through, you know, um, that's really linked to um, the COVID-19 pandemic? And if any of you has a fun or like, you know, great title to share, please do. To be really honest, I hope that we, whilst not disrespecting that we're in a COVID-19 moment, we also need to respect the researchers, the research and the preoccupations of artists. I would hate to see that artists have to speak about COVID-19 for a sake of political correctness. Mm -hmm. There is still a vast amount of human production needing to be discussed that may have impact by COVID-19, but I, I hope that we continue to respect the interests of artists despite this. Yes, definitely. Well, thank you so much for the comment, Zoe. And thank you, Aaron and Mustafa as well for such a great panel discussion. I enjoyed this conversation very much. I hope you have as well. Um, I would like to thank the audience for tuning in and spending the past hour with us. And I'd like to invite all of you to join us for the rest of the Pivot Conference. Do visit artemarket.net slash pivot for more information. So cheers, everyone, and see you tomorrow. Bye, guys. Bye, bye. Bye.